All right. Thanks very much, Nick. Yeah, and uh, not just thanks for the introduction, but also thanks for actually like putting together this entire Sayano uh, online seminar series. I mean, I guess it's not just Nick, but also Ilka and many other people. And um, in my opinion, this is like extremely valuable for establishing the entire community. So thank you very much, Nick, for uh, for all your efforts in this regard. And um, yeah, as you already mentioned before, I um, already gave quite a few similar talks. Maybe some of you have already seen my talk uh, at the VRM meeting just about a week ago or so. So there might be a little repetition in that. I, um, my apologies for that. Um, and um, I guess one of the reasons why I enjoy talking so much about my topic is because I think it is actually a really fascinating field we all are working in at the moment. Like the cyanobacterial topic is, I think, really an emerging field. And I guess it's um, so many exciting things coming up at the moment. And one potential or one aspect of this um, work with cyanobacteria I would now like to, uh, to talk about in my presentation today. But maybe let me get started first by actually highlighting um, what um, motivated me um, to actually start my, my work in the first place, place. And this is um, a picture like this one, for example. So um, I don't know. Um, so it's, this picture is supposed to, to represent the contamination of our global ecosystems with plastic trash. And um, I guess many of you have already heard about this topic before, or maybe this can also be a question to you in the audience right now, um, which you can just ask yourself. Um, how familiar are you already with this topic? Because um, I guess many of you have heard about it, but unlike other crises, like for example, the Corona crisis or the climate change crisis, um, it's still a rather minor topic, I, I got the impression, for most people. And hence, I would just like to challenge you, how much do you actually know about this? And um, to give just one number, which in my mind at least, um, highlights quite nicely how huge this crisis is and potentially how underestimated it is, it could be the following one. So um, in a recent study, it's been suggested that more than 90% of the plastic which we've released to the ocean has already been sunk to the ocean floor. So in other words, when we're talking about this, these issues, when we're talking about like these trash islands somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, we're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And the true problem is actually far greater than what we, what we can visually see. Um, so obviously, we have to do something about this. And uh, I guess this is also where cyanobacteria come into play. Uh, because maybe they can actually provide a technological solution for this problem. Uh, and the strain I'm working with is probably very familiar to many of you because it's the best characterized cyanobacterium there is, Sinicrisis 6803. Um, and um, that's how it looks like under the microscope. And that's how it looks like under the electron microscope or the TEM. And uh, I think you can see quite nicely that the cells have like these thin filaments here. That's where um, the, the magic happens, so to say. That's where the photosynthesis takes place. And um, that's how pseudocrosis looks like if it, if it has like uh, all the nutrients it needs, if it grows happily. And one of the nutrients it needs for that is actually nitrogen. However, even if no nitrogen is present, the cells have actually developed a sophisticated technique to survive these conditions of when nitrogen is absent, these conditions of starvation. And we refer to this process as chlorosis. And what's happening in this process is that the cells start to degrade their photosynthetic apparatus, specifically chlorophyll A and the phycobilisomes. And you can also see this quite nicely uh, visually. For example, here, like on the, on the bottom row, you can see how the color is changing through the course of several days to weeks from a bright green to this intense orange on the right-hand side. But it's not just the visual appearance which is changing over time. It's also the interior of the cell, which changes quite a bit. As you can see here in this next temp picture, uh, which obviously, in contrast to the previous one, looks quite different when no nitrogen is present. And one of the cool features, I think, about this entire chlorosis process is that it's, uh, that it's completely reversible. So upon the addition of nitrogen, it just takes the cells one or two days to fully recover, even after months or up to years of nitrogen starvation. So the cells can really go into like a zombie mode and then after a few days uh, resuscitate completely. And I would now like to give you a little overview about what's actually happening within the cell during this chlorotic state. Um, and one of the most remarkable things is that the cells accumulate large quantities of biopolymers, one of them actually being glycogen. Um, and as you can see here in this quantification of glycogen, um, the glycogen accumulation starts very rapid here after the onset of nitrogen starvation. So it's a rapid formation. And then from there on, after the first days, um, the cell cells start to slowly eat up a little bit of this glycogen and slowly degrade it over time. 
And this is probably due to the fact that glycogen serves as the main carbon and energy storage for the cell. So we're assuming that this is actually um, that the glycogen is just like the energy storage, which the cells eat up or like uh, get energy from during this starvation process. But glycogen is not the only biopolymer. There's also a second one, which we call PHB. And I've encircled it here in red in this electron microscopic picture. Those are those big white granules. And um, that's uh, how um, PHB, the chemical structure looks like. It actually stands for polyhydroxybutyrate. And just like glycogen, it's also a carbon polymer which consists out of three hydroxybutyric acid monomers. Um, and in contrast to glycogen, however, the formation of PHB is not rapid, but rather slow. It actually takes several days to weeks until it's fully accumulated. And also in contrast to glycogen, the physiological function of PHB is not known yet. So we know that it's not a carbon or energy storage, at least from the data we've seen so far. So this is still uh, um, has to be further elucidated. But what we do know is the function of PHB for us human beings, because um, PHB actually serves as a very promising candidate for a new sustainable and biodegradable bioplastic. And um, it's also sustainable because since it's produced from a photoautotrophic organism like Synecocystis, it can actually be produced from the CO2 of the atmosphere and thereby become like a carbon neutral product. However, the problem when I first started my PhD was that Synecocystis naturally produces only small amounts of this PHB, roughly 10, maybe 15% of its cell dry weight. So the main task for me was to better understand the PHB metabolism, to be then able to further optimize the production afterwards. And um, to show you some of the results of my PhD, I have subdivided the results into four different aspects, which I will just guide you through now. The first one will be about the general physiology. So under which environmental conditions and which physiological conditions is PHB important? Second aspect will about, be about regulators. So proteins which are involved in the formation of PHB. Third one will be about the general metabolism. So what are uh, the pathways which are required for the formation of PHB? And then finally, we try to put all of this knowledge together and apply some metabolic engineering approaches to actually produce overproduction strains. All right, so let's dig right in and start with the first, the physiological aspect of my story. And when I first started my PhD, um, I first wanted to further investigate what are the conditions which are actually favoring the production of PHB, like the outside conditions, so to say. And for this, I starved my cells from nitrogen for 14 days to basically initiate the PHB production and cultivated the cells under various different uh, environmental conditions. For example, including either constant light or alternating, uh, alternating day-night rhythm. And I combined those factors with either constant shaking to ensure um, well, uh, thorough aeration, or I just let the culture stand to create some sort of microaerobic conditions to see what's the influence on the PHB concentration. And here you can actually see the first piece of data in my presentation. Um, so on the y-axis, I show you the accumulation of PHB within the cell. So how much PHB is inside the cell. And you can see that under our standard laboratory conditions, here shown as the black bar, which is like constant elimination and constant shaking, the cells produce approximately 12, maybe 13% PHB per cell dry weight. However, when we then turned off the shaker shown here in the next bar, um, the amount of PHB actually dropped quite a bit. So it seems that constant aeration uh, uh, caused by the shaking process is actually beneficial for PHB production. And we observed the opposite effect when we cultivated the cells not on a constant light, but on a day-night rhythm of 12 hours light, 12 hours darkness. And there you can see that uh, this actually resulted in an increase of PHB production. So we concluded that indeed day-night illumination as well as constant aeration do favor the formation of PHB. And during these studies, we also observed another interesting phenomena, which I don't know if any of you have ever seen something like this before. When I first saw it, it was quite impressive, which is the heterogeneity of certain cells. Um, so because apparently the cells do not uh, all produce the same amount of PHB, but it differs quite strongly. And what you can see here in this fluorescence microscopic picture is that I've stained the PHB granules with a red dye called Nile Red, which is like basically a hydrophobic dye, and um, which helped us or allowed us to stain the PHB granules. And what we saw was that some of the cells, for example, those ones here, 
have plenty of, of different PHP granules and they're also rather large. While in contrast to that, we also had quite a few other cells which had only very few granules or rather small granules like this one here, for example. And we, we observed the same phenomena when we looked at the electron microscope. Here again, some cells had plenty of granules and rather large, while other cells had only very few granules and rather small ones. So we're curious, what is actually the reason for that? So we tried to further investigate this by using a fax analysis. What we wanted to investigate is um, how is the distribution of like high producers versus low producer cells? And here you can see um, the results. So um, on the y-axis, you see the amount of cells, so how many cells are there? And on the x-axis, you see the fluorescence intensity, which uh, correlates to the amount of PHB within the cell. And what we observed was that in comparison to an unstained control here shown in gray, and also in comparison to a PHB-free mutant here depicted in pink, our wild type showed a really interesting um, distribution pattern. Because what we observed was that the majority of cells um, here represented by this large peak actually contained only small amounts of PHB, while a relatively small fraction of the cells contained larger amounts of PHB, represented by this shoulder here. So we were curious, what's the reason for that? And maybe that there's like, if there's like a genetic cause for that. So to just like ask the question, um, do the high producing cells, like those shoulder cells here, um, will they also produce um, PHB in the next generation? So what we did was that we actually separated both populations of low producers and high producers and did another iteration of this experiment. So again, starved them from nitrogen and again let them produce PHB to see if this, um, if this pattern remained. However, what we saw was that regardless if the, the, if the parental generation were low producers or high producers, um, they all reestablished the original um, pattern. Um, and that basically draws to the conclusion that although there is a strong heterogeneity present of the PHB content, it's not based on any genetic differences. But we assume that it's rather some sort of bet hedging strategy. Um, all right, um, but this still leaves open a very fundamental question, which I just barely talked about for now, uh, which is the physiological function. And maybe some of the people who already attended a previous um, 4IM Suano group seminar um, might remember that I already invested quite a bit of time into finding the physiological function, but I was still unable to actually discover it. But I guess there has to be something, right? Because just to, to show you this picture again, if you take a look at the cells and if you see like what a large fraction of cells are actually composed out of this PHB and that the cells have developed a sophisticated mechanism to differentiate between like high producers and low producers, there should be a physiological reason for that, right? And um, another indication for this is that a recent study has shown um, that when they investigated 137 different cyanobacterial strains, 134 out of them were actually capable of producing PHB. And I guess um, if there wouldn't be an evolutionary advantage of that, the cells would have given up on that already quite some while ago. So um, maybe that's also an interesting topic for you and the cyanobacterial community to further investigate this, I think is a really fascinating topic here. All right, with this I already come to the second sub project of my presentation, which we will be about the general regulators. And I would like to take this as an opportunity to also give you a general impression of how the metabolism works, but also how the PHB granules look like. So just a quick overview about uh, our current understanding and the schematic overview. So um, what we believe is that at the inside of the PHB is the so-called PHB core. This is just like the elongated carbon polymer. And this PHB core is actually surrounded by a variety of different proteins, uh, which serve uh, different functions in the cell. One of these proteins could be, for example, the polymerase, which is required for the elongation of the carbon chain. Second class of proteins are the so-called phasins, which are just covering and thereby shielding the PHB granule. Third one are potential regulators, which are, for example, um, activating or deactivating the polymerase. And then the fourth one is the depolymerase enzyme, which is required for degrading the, the PHB granule. In Synecosystis, however, we only know the first two class of proteins. So we found the polymerase and we found one phasin. What we know from other bacteria who are producing PHP that there are probably also regulators and depolymerases involved. And if you would be able to actually identify the protein which encodes for the depolymerase, we could potentially just knock it out and thereby the cells would be unable to degrade their, their polymers 
and would accumulate maybe even more. There was the intention and the rationale behind this, uh, this experiment. And based on some preliminary experiments and also some bioinformatic analysis, we identified the following genetic operon, which consists out of four genes. And two out of these genes actually showed interesting homologies. One of them is the so-called SLRO58, which I also refer to as the red protein from now on, um, which showed sequence homologies to a, uh, to a phasin, so one of those proteins covering the PHP granule. And the second uh, um, protein, the so-called SLRO60, showed similarities to a depolymerase um, because it has like a, a predicted esterase function. So we, with the help of two master students of mine, we created knockout strains of both, um, of both genes and further investigated them. Uh, first, we char characterized the growth behavior. And as you can see in liquid medium, um, all three strains grow more or less the same, like there's like not a drastic difference. Although this, this, the red strain, the SLO058, grew the worst in comparison to both others. And this was also something we observed when we grew them on solid agar plates, as you can see here, where the SLO058 grows about 10 times worse in comparison to the wild type. Um, but um, since we were also interested in the depolymerase function, we also wanted to quantify the amount of PHB inside those mutant strains. And, um, we were particularly interested in the time part of the resuscitation, so after the right transturbation, because what we what we believed was that um, uh, how how the PHP metabolism works is the following: so after the onset of nitrogen starvation, so here at the beginning, the cells start to slowly accumulate PHP, and then after some time, when you add nitrogen again, the cells would also degrade the po polymer again. However, uh, and yeah, and in this in, in this experiment, I will only focus on the last part essentially, just, just the the resuscitation part, because that's where we assume the depolymerization takes place. But what we observed to our surprise was that all three of the strains um, uh, had like a more or less constant amount of PHB, and there was not really a strong decay, not a strong decrease of PHB polymers occurring. So we concluded that at least under our specific laboratory conditions there seems to be no degradation of PHP at all, which was quite surprising. Okay, so unfortunately, this, this one protein, the blue depolymerase protein um, was, um, was not turning out to be a depolymerase, but what about the other one, the, the red protein, the SLR058, does it actually serve as a phasin? So to, you know, to investigate this, we actually uh, quantified the granule number during chlorosis. Because as you can see here on this pictogram on the top right side, um, a classical phasin is expected to sit at the outside of the PHP granule and thereby also regulating the volume to size ratio of these granules. Um, and um, for this, we quantified the, um, the amount of granules per cell. And what we, what we saw was that the wild type usually had roughly two or three granules per cell. And interestingly, in contrast to that, um, the, the delta SLR058, the, the red mutant strain, um, had like showed like strongly increased amount of granules per cell, while the other mutant just showed like uh, pretty much wild type behavior. And uh, thanks to uh, the, the tidiest work of my master students, they counted like numerous cells and hundreds of cells. We were able to quantify this effect. And there we were able to show that the delta SLR058 mutant contained more than twice as many granules in comparison to the wild type. Um, so we concluded that indeed this protein somehow regulates the number of PHP granules. But is it actually reassembling a classic phasin? For this, it would actually has to it would have to sit on the outside of the PHP granule. So for this, we constructed um, we wanted to to localize the protein inside the cell, and hence we we constructed um, GFP um, tagged protein fusions. And um, as you can see here in this fluorescence microscopic picture. Um, the cell, which is uh, resembled here by this white envelope, um, had or contained a few accumulations of our slr 8 protein, shown here by these green dots, uh, at least under vegetative growth. But interestingly, when we took away the nitrogen source, uh, those accumulations and aggregates of slr 8 got more dispersed over time, where we expected rather the opposite. So we concluded that apparently Although this SLR058 influences the number of PHP granules, it doesn't localize on the PHP surface and does had not um, represent a classical phasin. 
and the true mode of action has still to be discovered. All right, with this, I'm already coming to the third aspect of my talk, which will be about the general metabolism. So how is PHP actually formed? And um, when I started this project, um, I was interested to answer essentially just one main question, which is the following, where is actually the carbon derived from? Because what, because what we knew from a recent publication was that more than 80% of the carbon, of the PHP carbon, is coming from intracellular recycling. So apparently during chlorosis, the cells take up CO2 from the outside, then they convert the CO2 into some sort of intermediate metabolite, which is then further converted into um, PHB. But what this intermediate metabolite was, no one knew until then. And to explain you our experimental setup, I will just um, give you a quick overview about the most important carbon pathways in Synecrosystis, which are shown here in this slide. And I would like to, you to first focus on the bottom of the slide, because that's where you can see the PHB metabolism in the bottom row. And it all starts actually with um, two units of acetyl-CoA, which serves as a precursor of PHB. And then two units of this acetyl-CoA uh, get condensed via an enzyme called FeA, FeA to acetoacetyl-CoA, which gets then further reduced via FeB and under the expense of 1-NDPH to 3-hydroxybutyryl-CoA, and which get, then gets further polymerized via this protein FeEC to the final PHB granule. Okay, so so far for the PHB metabolism. But um, where is the carbon coming from now? And one initial hypothesis we had, and this also brings me back to the introduction of my presentation, maybe it's actually coming from the intracellular amounts of glycogen. Because as you might remember from the introduction of my talk, the cells also accumulate large amounts of glycogen at the during chlorosis. So that's why I also highlighted the so-called glycogen up here in the slide. Um, which are essentially all the metabolites and all the enzymes which are involved in glycogen metabolism. And in order to prove or disprove our hypothesis, if both carbon polymers are interconnected, um, we investigated certain mutants which were disturbed in this glycogen metabolism, for example, in the degradation. Um, specifically, they were lacking uh, one or two of the glycogen phosphorylases, the GLGP1 or GLGP2. Those are two isoforms. And we already knew from previous experiments in our laboratory that the GLGP1 is apparently a rather unimportant isoform, while the GLGP2 seems to be more important. Okay, so we wanted to test if also uh, if the degradation of glycogen also affects the PHP accumulation. So for this, we first quantified the amount of glycogen in the cells. And as you can see here in this graph, over time, the wild type here depicted in black accumulated uh, reasonable amounts of glycogen and then slowly degraded it. And this was also the pattern for the rather unimportant isoform, the GLGP1. But interestingly, in contrast to that, the GLGP2 mutant um, didn't degrade glycogen very much, just very slightly. And when we actually uh, knocked out both isoforms, in case of the double knockout, GLGP1, P2, we even saw a further increase of glycogen over time. So that was a good proof of principle because apparently our mutants are working and glycogen is not degraded in those isoforms. Um, but what about the PHB amount, you might wonder? Well, fortunately enough, as you can see here in this graph, uh, in comparison to the wild type and also in comparison to the rather unimportant GLGP1 isoform, both mutant strains where the important isoform, the GLGP2 was missing, um, produced barely any amounts of PHB at all. And hence we concluded that apparently both bio, uh, biopolymers, the PHB and the glycogen are interconnected. Um, so that was a good first indication. And if you wanted to further approve this, and therefore we also investigated other uh, enzymes involved, for example, the glycogen synthase, GLGA1 and GLGA2, as well as the GLGC enzyme, and all of the results pointed in a very similar direction. Okay, so at this point, we were quite confident that both biopolymers are interconnected. But how actually? And uh, yeah, maybe those of you who actually attended this, uh, the great talk from Kirsten Gutekunst a few weeks ago, also in the seminar series here, might remember that Synecrosis actually has three main carbon pathways. The first one is the EMP pathway, which resembles the classic glycolysis. The second one is the Andrew pathway, here shown in green. And then finally, depicted in orange is the OPP, the oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. And by again investigating knockout strains of the individual pathways, we were able to show that the EMP pathway is by far the most important pathway for the PHB biosynthesis. 
All right. Uh, this being said, we already come to the fourth and final aspect of my presentation, which is, at least in my personal opinion, the most fun part, uh, because it's the metabolic engineering part. And for this, we try to use all of the knowledge which we've learned from the previous projects and try to use them to create overproduction strains. So let me just recap what I've just told you. Um, we just learned that apparently glycogen and PHB are interconnected through the EMP pathway. Um, so our intention was if you can actually like speed up the degradation of glycogen, maybe more carbon flux is going through the cell and more carbon would be available for PHB. But how could we speed up the process? What is the bottleneck? I mean, it's like many enzymes are involved along the way here. And at this time, it came in real handy that in our laboratory, a new regulator was discovered, the so-called SLL0944 protein, which we also refer to as the PSC protein. And it turned out, uh, as, or as we found out in our laboratory, um, this PSC protein or the SLL0944 is acting as an inhibitor of the PGAM enzyme, which sits here. And it's apparently some sort of like a bottleneck enzyme when it comes to the conversion from glycerol 3 phosphate to glycerol 2 phosphate. So our hope was that if we actually delete this SLL0944 protein, it would be more or less like opening the tab from a, from a water tap so that more, uh, more carbon could flow through the cell. And for this, we first investigated the amount of glycogen in the cell. And what we observed was that in contrast to the, um, the wild type, which slowly degraded its glycogen uh, contents, our mutant strain, the SLL0944, had a much more rapid degradation of glycogen. Um, but did this also affect the PHB amount? Well, fortunately enough, yes, it did. So what we observed was that in comparison to the wild type and all shown in, in green, and also in comparison to the complemented strain shown in black, our new mutant strain, the Delta SLL0944, um, accumulated much larger amounts of PHB. And these results are actually just part of a much larger study of the PSC mutant regulator, uh, which was recently published in PNAS, mostly by the work of some co-workers of ours and from our laboratory. And it's a great paper. If you haven't read it yet, you might want to check it out. Anyway, coming back to my main story, how can we produce more PHB in the cells? Um, so we, we discovered that uh, PSC is an important regulator and knocking out is beneficial for the PHB production. And um, by looking through the literature, I found that further bottlenecks, actually the enzymes FeA and FeB. So what I did was that I overexpressed both proteins from a heterologous host, um, the organism Ralstonia eutrophia, which is known for its high PHB production values. And um, the hope was that this will actually open the, the water tap even further and that even more flux could come through towards PHB. And um, we, we termed the new strain Delta SLL0944 REFAB. And since this is a rather unhandy name, we decided to return it to PPT1, just that you know what I will talk about in the next couple of slides. Okay, so first we wanted to actually like characterize this new strain. For example, does it also grow properly? Because I mean, if it's growing crippled, it's not really good for anything, right? Uh, but as you can see here in this growth curve, it seems to grow under normal conditions, just as good as the wild type which was a, a good first proof of principle. But does it also produce more PHB? Well, as you can see here in this, in this slide, in this graph, um, in comparison to the wild type in green, and also in comparison to the individual mutants, which only um, lack the regulator SLL0944, or which only overexpressed the biosynthesis genes, our new mutant strain produced actually uh, significantly more PHB, um, uh, which is around 40% of PHB per cell dry weight. So that was already a good first start, but we wanted to even further optimize it. So at that time, I reminded myself what I learned in the first aspect of my, of my PhD, which was about the physiological conditions and how the environment influenced it. So I tried to optimize these conditions further. And what I did was, for example, to cultivate our cells under day night illumination. I furthermore staffed the cells not only for nitrogen, but also for phosphorus, which was also shown in literature to be beneficial. And we also played around with different carbon sources in the cell. And the results you can see here, for example, in this case, I added 100 millimolar of the inorganic bicarbonate source. And we, what we observed was that in comparison to the wild type, our new mutant strain showed strongly increased accumulation of PHB, more than 60% of the cell dry was actually composed of it. And when we replaced bicarbonate by small amounts of 10 millimolar acetate, we were, further, we were able to further boost it to more than 
of PHP within the cell, which was the, the highest amount ever achieved in any photoautotrophic organism. And while those numbers are already quite impressive when we first saw them, I guess um, the, the, the microscopic pictures are even more. So first fluorescence microscopic pictures, you can see that um, the, the PHB granules really fill up the cells qu quite a bit. And when we look through the electron microscope, we more or less observe the same picture. Under those optimized conditions, even our wild type has relatively large PHB granules, but they were still relatively small in comparison to our new mutant strain. As you can see here in this picture, the, the PHB granules pretty much fill up the entire interior of the cell. And in several cases, we even saw that the PHB granules were so large that they even ruptured the cell wall, as you can see on the top left. And we saw this several times. For example, in this picture, you even see like some of the bioplastic PHB leaking out of the cell. Um, a friend of mine has once described this as uh, that it looks a little, little bit like the cells are farting PHB. I don't know if this is actually a good um, scientific description of it, but if it is, then the, the next uh, one would probably be PHB diarrhea. So uh, however you want to call it, um, I guess you all agree that um, in our new strain, it really reached an upper limit of how much PHB the cells can actually take. All right, with this, I'm already at the end more or less, and I would just like to sum up the most important aspects. Um, in, the, in the beginning, I told you that the day-night rhythm, as well as aeration, play an important um, environmental condition for the PHB formation. Furthermore, I told you that we discovered that uh, this PHB granules are distributed very heterogeneously and that this is not based on any genetic differences. Furthermore, we were able to show that PHB is not degraded during resuscitation, surprisingly. And we also were able to show that SLR0058 is an important protein when it comes to regulating how many granules are produced in the cell. In the third aspect of my talk, I told you that both biopolymers, PHB and glycogen, are interconnected. And furthermore, that the EMP pathway is the most important one. And then the fourth and final aspect, I told you that the SLLO944 um, protein is an important regulator for the PHB production. And finally, our new strain was able to create more than 80% PHB per cell dry weight. And of course, on the long one, we would like to apply all of this knowledge for sustainable bioplastic production in order to solve our ecological problems. But this may be also like a question to you in the audience. Do our strains really help us solving our environmental problems now? Well, I don't know, you might wanna answer this question for yourself and I'm also looking forward to the discussion with you afterwards. Um, but um, I would say yes and no. And um, the reasons why I'm still a bit skeptical, I've highlighted here in the next slide. Um, because you could maybe think, well, now everything is good. We produced large amounts of PHB, so the bioplastic crisis is solved. But I'm afraid that we're still quite far away from that. And I would just like to give a few arguments why I think this is the case. The first couple, a group of arguments involves around technological obstacles. One example is, as many of you are probably aware, that we're still lacking um, the right infrastructure to actually produce cyanobacteria in a, such a high amount that we required because all of the, the experiments I showed you in my, in my presentation here were based on a laboratory scale, like of like maybe 50 or 100 milliliters. But obviously, if you want to produce bioplastic, we have to think about huge amounts, like tons and hundreds and thousands of tons. Second argument is that all of these experiments were performed in Synecosystis, which is great because it's so well understood and such a great characterized organism. But if you actually think about um, large scale production, one would also have to include um, much more robust strains, which are able to also grow, for example, outside under non-sterile conditions. Another uh, aspect which you still have to overcome are downstream processing obstacles. So what I mean with this is that um, Synecosystis is a unicellular organism, and it's actually quite challenging to isolate a unicellular organism from the medium. And furthermore, if you actually would like to extract the PHB from the cell, you also have to extract other, um, other compartments, for example, the pigments, which can also be quite challenging. And then fourth and finally, um, we still lack quite a bit of money from investors because at the moment, our PHB production is at least, and I really say at least with an emphasis, um, is at least 10 times more too expensive in comparison to heterotrophic organisms. So although our technology, I think, looks quite sexy if you first look at it, I think there's still a lot of quite a bit of room for improvement.
And those are obviously just the technical obstacles. And I think uh, the true problems go far beyond that. Because if we actually um, take, a, take a step outside of the lab, we might realize that <clears throat> if we just would like to keep on using the same amounts of, bio, of plastic as we do today, uh, we would actually have to build up a huge uh, infrastructure um, for building these amounts of bioplastics. And these, again, would obviously also require huge amounts of resources, not just for the factories which we have to build, but also when it comes to like energy production. If you think about the huge amounts of plastic we produce nowadays, it would also require huge amounts of energy for the production of bioplastics. And then finally, um, this entire scale up of the new technology just takes time. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't invest this time into like developing further technologies. I'm just saying that our current ecological crisis are taking place right now. And we don't have the time to wait much longer for crises like the plastic contamination in our oceans, nor for issues like the climate change. So I think we have to act now, we have to act fast. And what I would hence advocate for and what I pr propose is that our technological solutions are just part of, of the bigger holistic solution, which we have to aim for. And that we should also not rely completely on them, but in the, in, instead, we also have to take into consideration that we also need a societal as well as a political transformation to tackle these problems as a whole and holistically. And I guess that's also where you as a scientist and as a member of the scientific community come into play. Because I think it's nowadays it's not enough anymore to just produce data and hope that, this, that the community or the, the, the society will be smart enough to actually interpret those data properly. But much rather, we should also step out of the universities and also engage into the public. And one example how one could do this are, for example, the scientists for future. Those are just a group of scientists who also advocate for a more sustainable future um, and, and a more sustainable society. And I think this is just one out of many examples how we as scientists can engage with the public. And although I'm obviously aware that those are like a little bit provoking um, hypothesis, I'm, um, I'm really happy to further discuss this with you afterwards. And with this, I think I'm already at the end of my presentation. I would just like to quickly acknowledge a couple of people which helped me with this work. Um, by far most important, Karl Forchhammer, the lab of the Forchhammer group, who was really like the mastermind of this entire study, as well as two master students I already talked about before, Tim and Jeanette. Tim is actually the first author of the PNAS paper, as I mentioned before. And then we have Kenneth and Sophia, which helped me with the physiological studies. Uh, and I also have to thank a couple of like, um, other institutions also for financial support, specifically the Studienship Thanks Deutschland Focus for uh, funding generously my entire PhD. So thank you very much for them. And also obviously thank you very much to you in the audience for your kind attention. Thank you. <laughs>